Hi, I'm Jim Sullivan, and welcome back to Boston Rock Talk. You've just been listening to Thievery Corporation. We are here with one of the thieves, Rob Garza. Welcome, Rob. Good morning. Uh, I got to say, when I first heard the name of the band back in the, I guess, mid-90s, late-90s, I liked you already, Thievery Corporation. It, there's several connotations yes. to that. But what was your meaning in taking that name? Um, I think it's just playing around with words, and it just sounded kind of sinister. You know, at that time there were like bands called Meat Beat Manifesto, My Life with the Thrill Kill Cult, yeah. Renegade Soundwave, all these sort of things. And so I started a record label when I was 20 years old called Juju Thievery Corporation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then when I met Eric, I actually recorded. Um, I didn't record. I did some mastering sessions. He had a little studio in, in D.C. and um, I went to this club one day and Eric opened it up with his partners and he walked in, I walked in and he's like, you know, are you Rob Garza, Garza Juju Thievery Corporation? I'm like, yeah. He's like, he's like, I always thought that was the coolest name. Let's do something. And he, he was putting out records. I was putting out records and we were both influenced by things like Bossa Nova, jazz, dub, Indian soundtrack music and things like that. And we wanted to put it together with electronic music right. and make something that sounded like it could be from the past or it could be from the future. And uh, you know that was our intention when we started. And the name Thievery Corporation sort of fit because of samples and things like that at the time, which was a big thing. Like, You're taking bits from others. Yes. But in a benevolent it, way. Exactly, right, yes. Exactly. <laughs> well, and the other uh, thievery corporation sort of thing. I thought anyone when I first heard it was one of the perfect name for a band in the record industry. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're, yeah. Just, you're just being right up front. <laughs> exactly. Thievery corporation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of corporations are thievery corporations. There you go. You yeah. just got the name, right? Yeah. Um, actually, you should explain to people too, because uh, Eric is the other half of yep. Thievery Corporation. What we saw here today was how many players did you have here today? Nine? Uh, yeah, something like that. Singers, yeah, uh, it changes uh, every. Every time tour, we play, yeah. every tour. But Eric is, uh, my understanding, 50% of it. You're 50% yes. of it. How do you guys work together? Eric is my partner. Um, we have a studio in Washington, D.C., and a lot of it just happens with us just playing with uh, samplers and picking up instruments, guitars, basses, keys, stuff like that. Do you each play all kinds of things? Yeah, we, you know, both of us, or neither of us are, you know, just uh, crazy players, but we're both good at coming up with little ideas mm -hmm. and we're good at layering things so that it becomes like a you know expressive track or things like so that. you can transmit your ideas to the musicians yeah. they can pick up on it and bring into their well a lot, a lot on a lot of the records we play a lot of the music so oh, okay yeah, yeah. yeah um, so. we play well enough to, <laughs> to <laughs> do something but that's the beauty of electronic music because you're only limited by your imagination yeah. and you know, we live in a cut and paste world where if you can kind of get a groove right one time and then, you know, get another part of the groove. And, you know, so we kind of approach it different in terms of, you know, it's more of a production than it is a performance. But what's real interesting about what, you, what we just saw here today, mm -hmm. uh, you guys are, are very much a performing band, very yeah. lively. Uh, and I was smiling when I was watching it because I know in the past some people have described you as, oh, they're kind of an easy listening band. Right. You're not an easy listening band. Well, easy listening has a bad connotation, you yeah. know, because <laughs> people talk about jazz records as easy listening. Yeah. People talk about Antonio Carlos Jobim as easy listening. People talk about old Italian soundtracks as easy listening, you know, but there's still great music, but, right, right. you know, they don't really know what it means. but. You know, me and Eric are very inspired by live music. We would hang out a lot at bars and clubs and listen to actual musicians. Mm -hmm. So we realized that, you know, our strength is probably more on the production side, but we like to incorporate, you know, great musicians and performers mm -hmm. and bring them into sort of the collective. Let me ask you about the decision to bring in so many singers, too, which I think is, is terrific. Uh, and you've worked with... I don't know, how many singers over the years would you say, if you can even put a number on it? Uh, yeah, a lot. I would say like over 50, you know. And, I mean, David Byrne was with you at David one point. David Byrne, Wayne Coyne. Coyne, yeah. Uh, uh, Femi Kuti. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, there's Sue George. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot. 
lot of the different ones. So, so you must have uh, Harry Farrell is another. Oh, one. Oh, that's right. There must be sort of a cachet for some of these guys. Like, yeah, I'll join for a song. Yeah, I'll do, you know, I'll do that. Now it's cool because we're not your typical band. We're not just four dudes. Play, you know, we each but, have our guitar, bass, drums, and vocals. Uh, we get to sort of be a production unit, so mm -hmm. we kind of can work with whoever we want, and we get to work within different genres of music, which makes it feel very liberating. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the difference of kind of what separates us as a production unit versus a band, necessarily. Right. Right. Do you think you throw your fans at all with each new direction, each new album? Or do they accept that sort of fluidity and change? I think they accept the fluidity and uh, you know we we hope to kind of catch people off guard a little bit mm -hmm. you know with working with different artists whether it's from Africa like Femi Kuti or David Byrne um, you know that's just really the beauty of, of what we do because you know when we're in the studio each time can be very different right now you didn't play anything from the upcoming album today no. but let's talk a little bit about what you're doing that's coming out February 10th I believe February 10th. And uh, the title is? Temple of I and I. And what does that mean to you? Um, I and I is the self. And so it's kind of really like temple of the self and just imagination. And we recorded this record down in Port Antonio, Jamaica mm -hmm. at GGM Studios. And um, it's the first time we recorded outside of Washington. And Eric called me up. I think he was on holiday with his girlfriend. And he was like, you know, I'm down here at this place. They have like a great recording studio. Do you want to come down? I was like, you know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. And so um, took the band down there and we just all, you know, just kind of in the morning, we'd go out to the beach, hang out in the beautiful scenery and then just lock ourselves in the studio for about 12 hours and drink Jamaican rum and, and make music and smoke some of the local products. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Why not, right? You're there. When in, when in Jamaica, when right? in Jamaica yes. of course, of course. Um, and I mean, I, I've heard the record. I heard an advance of it, and it is, uh, you know, very dub and reggae influence. Uh, tell me about how easy it was to move into that area. Well, I think that's always sort of been one of the foundation of the Thievery sounds. Is just this sort of dub underpinnings within our music. Even if we're doing bossa nova music, it still has this sort of dubby bass line underneath, which. Um, you know, for us, I think since we met, has always been a sort of a major influence to go to Jamaica and actually kind of be in the environment, be in the culture, um, and work with artists and just really do a whole record that's predominantly focused on, you know, reggae and dub music was just a, a highlight of our career. It starts off, I think, or one of the early songs is, uh, is a cry of Ja Rastafari. Anybody Rastafarian in the group? Uh, well, we don't have Roots and Z here today. Um, so we actually have about four other singers. <laughs> right, of, course. Other, <laughs> of course. Aren't here. Uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, they, are, you know, are. Z is actually the vocalist on the, the first track that, that you're yeah. talking about. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, so he couldn't be here today. But, uh, so he is a rest of yes. yes. That's good. Yes. And you're, fi you're, you're fine with incorporating that into what you do. I mean, you know, it's, uh, I think what we do transcends cultures and boundaries and things like that. And, you know, the, the thing about Thievery Corporation, I think it's about opening your ears and opening your mind. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, obviously, we've never been, you know, timid when it comes to our love of old Bollywood soundtracks mm -hmm. or old Jamaican right. dub records. Right. You know, and I, I think the thing that gets lost is people don't realize. But now there's an internet. All this stuff is easy to find, like, you know, just at the, you know, click of a, you know, your keyboard or whatever. But right. Back in the day, records were kind of how you knew there were other people out there in the world that shared similar sensibilities right. and tastes and, you know, just uh, love for different music. Meet, meet somebody in a record store thumbing through the yes. same section as you and going, <laughs> brother. Exactly. You know, yeah. I was talking with someone like, you know, when me and Eric got together, it's like. One of the things that brought us together is he had like a keyboard sampler and I had a drum machine sampler and we're like, 
let's actually put our equipment together and maybe we'll be able to make some music. Let's you make know? a baby. <laughs> yeah, let's make a band. You know, yeah. now everybody has that in their laptops. So right. Nobody really even right. thinks about that anymore. But a lot of bands got together because one guy had a guitar, another guy had a bass. So you're kind of an, kind of old school in a weird way. Yeah, it way. is. Yeah. What's uh, when you were playing here today? How do you define your role? Um, it's more like production and playing keys and samples. Usually I also have a drum machine sampler as well and kind of doing things. It's kind of like, a, you know, orchestrating in a way. And, you know, this, what we do incorporates a lot of different layers, like going to the sampling aspect. Like when we do drum beats, you know, we'll take maybe five different drum beats, you know, maybe a percussion from an old record or some kind of, hi-hat from another thing and so th those types of qualities are hard to get so there is a bit of track that we have that's underneath all of it that gives it that real sort of uh, timeless mm -hmm. feel that you get from vinyl mm, that's good you know that's so good. I noticed too your drummer here uh, he got out of jail apparently in his orange yes uh, I know he was he let out the, from the tour exactly but yeah. they let him we, keep the we picked him up on the highway somewhere you know don't, 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 don't report him yeah <laughs> silent. Um, I want to talk about uh, Amerimaka. Yeah. Uh, it seems to be, well, when was it written? That was done just 2008 or something? Maybe? Yeah, right around there. For so, uh, you want to talk a little bit about its thrust and uh, what, how it, what its pertinence is today? Um, yeah, the, the lyrics were written by a singer named Notch, um, who used to be in a band called Born Americans mm -hmm. back in the day. And, you know, that's one of our most popular songs. It's a song really having to do with sort of the American dream. What is it? Is it really a lie? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Maka in, uh, in Jamaica Batois has to do with being a thorn. A thorn. Yeah, so Mary Maka is like, you know, talking about the, you know, almost like the, the rose of the American dream. It's mm -hmm. kind of like this thorn mm -hmm. in a way as well. Um, you know, I, People really relate with that song. I mean, uh, you know, in terms of today, you can take it for for what you want. You know, so. Well, you guys have always sort of imbued songs with political meaning, I suppose. Some sometimes more than others. I think sometimes you've stepped away from it too. I guess. Uh -huh. yeah. Where are you at right now? Do you think these are times that demand bands yeah. be more political if they can? Our last record, we actually kind of sort of purposely stepped away from politics because we were recording a Bossa Nova record. Which one was that? Just Sodaje. Yeah. Okay. And it's sort of hard to do politics and Bossa Nova. They're not really Good point. great combinations. <laughs> Good point. And so the, the new record uh, kind of has a more, you know, socially conscious, uh, you know, thrust to it. Right. Um, you know, we we're very influenced by bands like Fugazi, The Clash, Public Enemy, people who weren't afraid to you know, speak out and convey a message within the music. And I think being from Washington, D.C., um, you know, we're disenchanted with the political system and we, re we realize how bureaucratic it is and how it really has nothing to do with, the, you know, the people can go into D.C. as a young person and be very idealistic and after a while they'll just get jaded by the political system sort of thing. So, you know, we grew up around a lot of do-it-yourself bands, mm -hmm. Minor Threat, the yeah. whole Discord scene. And so we wanted to do it ourselves. And we just, because we've never been part of a major label, we've always felt we could kind of say whatever we, we wanted. And when you get into dub and reggae music, it is very socially conscious and political. And, and also very, I mean, whatever you're saying in the lyrics, there's a real uplift to most of what you do, I think. You're, people are dancing, moving. Mm -hmm. You guys are moving on stage. So obviously there's a joyous element to it. Right. And, I, you know, that's, I guess, timeless in a way, isn't yeah. it? I mean, lay something on top of it that's yeah. uh, maybe a little harsh and appropriately so, and then but let yeah. the groove take it away. Look at it as an onion. You know, you can if you just want to appreciate the groove or whatever, you can dance and hang out and enjoy it. Or if you want to peel back a layer, there's a message there. You want to go even deeper, maybe the message is even a little deeper. Hi, I'm Jim Sullivan, and welcome back to Boston Rock Talk. Rob Garza is still here, and we are joined by Mr. Liff, hello, hello. who is going to be the vocalist on a song that you'll be hearing next. 
Uh, first of all, just welcome here. Welcome back to Boston. This is your hometown. Thank you so much. It's always good to be home. I was told not to talk to you about the Patriots. Oh, no, I love the Patriots. No, that's why I said that's <laughs> yeah. what I mean. No, the show will have to extend the no, show. No, yes. to talk yeah. about Okay, okay. yes. Uh, you, you cut your teeth here as, as very much a political rapper, mm. and then mm. you have joined these guys, at least to, to some degree. Yes. Explain the connection that you feel with uh, Thievery. It's, it's just a beautiful, uh, immediate connection is what it was. You know, I got a call actually from Eric Hilton at the end of 2009. We set a date of February 1st, 2010, to go into the studio together. Um, that song then went on to be called Culture of Fear, and I was definitely overjoyed when I uh, was told that it was going to be the title track of the album. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I was told to come to D.C. for rehearsals. And one of the most beautiful things about working with Thievery Corporation is that from the moment that I walked into that first rehearsal and met the band, we've been like this. And it has never changed. You know, this is a uh, little over five and a half years we've been working together, touring around the world together, and it's still just like this. It's That's a right. real family thing. And you operate your solo career as well in exactly. conjunction with what these guys do. Yes. I think, I mean, everybody in the band has other things they do, right? Yeah, everybody's kind of like working, you know, they do a couple different projects and things like that. Yeah, yeah. so it's, yeah. A, yeah, it's a great group. So, so they're not beholden to the, to the corporation, exactly, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about this song, uh, Unified Tribes, that yes. you wrote. My understanding is it came out of the Occupy movement. Yes, indeed. Tell me how it uh, developed. You know, we were just in the studio, and we, we just felt that what was going on at the time with the Occupy movement, we were moved by it. And we just, I don't know, I think that one of the things, uh, important things to do in music every now and then is to try to, capture uh, the energy of the time but try to represent it in a way that feels timeless you know so that's really what we were trying to do there we were trying to uh, we were inspired by people standing up for what they believe in and mobilizing and we wanted to make a song that could serve to uh, keep them infused with energy, the people that were on the front lines of the music mm -hmm. movement, but also a song that you could hear in 2016, 2020 mm -hmm. and still be feel inspired by and be energized by. Angry song? Hopeful song? How do you look at it? I think it's all mixed in there. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's all mixed in. And then when you come to the show and you see the live performance of it, you realize we're just trying to lift spirits and really just unify people in whatever the moment is, mm -hmm. you know? Um, really, you know, we get on stage and we talk about the fact that we're just bonded through the common experience of being there to feel whatever it is that we need to feel from enjoying live music, whether that's relief, uh, just letting go and cutting loose, whatever it is that you, that you get out of the experience, and hopefully some inspiration. Where does, where does the song usually fall in the set? Just come near the end? Towards the end, yeah. It's the end of the set. Okay, yeah. well, why, would you, why do you structure it that way? It's because it's energetic, it's uplifting. I think people really, you know, just feel enthusiastic when they hear that song. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, he really brings it in terms of the energy. Yeah. To sort of leave them with a real... Do you do an yeah. encore after that, or is that... Uh, Usually we have about another song and then and then an encore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, that's, yeah. That's but, it, but it's a it's a high note, you know. Yeah, yeah. Very, very good. Thank you so much for being here today, Rob. Yes. Appreciate it, Mr. Liff. Very nice Thank to you be very here. much. Thank you for having me. This us. has been Jim Sullivan for Boston Rock Talk, and we are going to have Thievery Corporation play you out with Unified Tribes. Thank you. <laughs>